watch everyone start to come in. <laughs> it's an extraordinary week. All of the sessions that Council is running this week all have an amazing First Nations focus. So it, it's, um, it's really cool. I think it's um, quite extraordinary so, that everything lined up. Is it cold where everybody is? A little bit cold in downtown Sydney, so I have to say. Travis, where are you coming to us from? Uh, I am living in uh, a little flat in Sydney at the moment, in Lavender Bay. John, you're in Sydney, Trish is Sydney, Marinda's in Queensland, my hometown. And it's sunny and warm. Oh, that's nice. Mm. I'm missing going home. I usually go home to Brisbane about once a month to see my mum. I haven't been able to go home for a while, so it's all a little bit strange. So <laughs> very, very strange times. We'll just give it another little minute or so and then we'll start to do the thing as everyone comes in. And we do try to keep it pretty close to time at the end, very conscious that lots of people have lots of back-to-back -back webinars and Zoom meetings at the moment. So, um, yes, Vicky, just panellists, just at the moment, we're about to start in two seconds or maybe maybe 15 seconds, just as everyone's coming through into the meeting. Hi, hi Irma. People starting to say hello as they come into the group. Well, I think we might start to start to kick off. So welcome to Think Inside the Square, everyone. My name is Celia Pavalev and I'm the Director of Marketing and Communications at the Australia Council for the Arts. And it's my great honour today to once again be your virtual MC. I don't know how I found myself in this chair, but somehow each week at two o'clock on a Tuesday, we're joining you with some really interesting conversations as we all are challenged and find our way through this period of COVID-19. Last week, I wrote that the stars aligned, but I actually think it was our digital producer who may have had a hand in aligning the stars this week, a week where all the sessions that are being offered through council from our webinars and our First Nations Roundtable on Friday have a First Nations focus. So today we are gathered here to talk about First Nations digital adaptation and the creation of new digital platforms. I'd like to acknowledge the Kamaragal peoples, the traditional owners of the land from which I'm coming to you today from I'd also like to acknowledge the many nations throughout Australia that we're all gathering from here online to talk about culture, platforms and adapting digitally. I'd like to pay my respects to Elders past and present and acknowledge all of our First Nations panellists today and First Nations peoples present and online in this session, the fifth session of our series. Um, Today we're going to shine a light on their oldest living culture in the world and our oldest living storytellers. We're going to talk about how First Nations artists and arts organisations are adapting to the digital landscape and talk a little about copyright protocols, some tips to protect your work online and talk about accessible resources in this space as well. Um, protecting your work online has been a hot topic over the last four, five, six weeks as we've actually come into this space and very, very quickly adapted to putting content online. Trish will talk a bit more about that, as will John and Terry Shanky will be joining Creative Connections later in the week from Council as well, but Trish will point to that as well. So once again, our deepest gratitude for the generosity of spirit that brings our panellists to our group today, a deadly panel to talk about the digital space. So a little housekeeping, our regulars know the drill by now, but if you're joining us for the first time, questions can come through the Q&A box. I'm pointing to the bottom of the screen because that's where the little Q&A box is for me and the little chat box. So this is a Zoom session that's being shot out through Facebook Live if you're joining us through Facebook. So they're the two ways to send your questions through. We're going to run through our panellists today each with, with a presentation, but we'll have a little conversation around that as well. So if you've got questions, we'll just see how time is going, but we'll probably answer some questions along the way, and then we might hopefully come together for a bit more of a chat and join joint questions towards the end. 
And one last little piece of housekeeping is that we also have closed captions through Zoom available to you by clicking on the little bottom again, I'm pointing to the bottom panel. So I think we'll kick off. So I think we've zipped into the housekeeping pretty quickly. So Travis DeRee, Melroy Man, is our, is our first panellist today, founder and director of Awesome Black. Travis is a celebrated visual artist, writer and producer. Awesome Black is a new First Nations digital creative content platform that gives audiences a way to engage and support the work of the creators they love. Travis will introduce Awesome Black, the functionality of the platform and the reasons why he created this solution. Over to you, Travis. Hello, sorry about the pause, I was just unmuting. Um, so I'm Travis, uh, director and founder, Awesome Black, I make a Melroy man. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, why Awesome Black and what it is. Um, so it's on face value, um, just a website, um, but it's also a whole lot more. Um, it's a network for um, First Nations artists and creatives who are making um, primarily online um, creative content. Um, so I uh, started a podcast um, called Bro Originals a couple of years ago alongside my brother. Um, we're a comedy show um, and we've been doing that uh, every week. We put out an episode um, and what we found is that we wanted to uh, kind of grow ourselves and grow our skills in that um, space, but also like grow our ability to um, have that as one of our primary sources of income. Um, and we came up with, we came across a few issues. So I've spent the last kind of 12 months um, researching uh, platforms and stuff across the world um, that could be a good solution for how to get more cut through in um, sort of the Australian uh, digital industry. Um, because there is a number of networks already out there um, like Wooshka, which um, a lot of Australian creatives use to kind of put their pod specifically podcasts out. Um, and I wanted to create a home that's more First Nations owned and run. Um, and so I, I kind of looked to some models in the US, um, specifically podcast platforms and how I can, how I could kind of retool them for a sort of wealth of First Nations digital content that could be out there. Um, and so it's all about growing a network for the creatives um, and uh, growing through strength in numbers of all of those creatives having an audience, growing those audiences together and then pulling them. Um, so a big why for me was, um, well, you've got ABC and NITV, ABC Indigenous, particularly that are kind of making that first nations digital content at the moment or being the sort of portals for the audiences to find them um and so that presents only one sort of facet of first nations content and um it's not necessarily the facet that i was really interested in um and like my content doesn't really fit in any of those homes so i was like well let's make a new home for it um and it's a, it's a space where we can like support each other through um, knowing that uh, we as creators and kind of innovators within this space, um, be it podcasting gamers, video content makers, um, arts online content makers, um, we have little pockets of expertise and knowledge that we can share. Um, so if I don't know how to do something, I'll reach out to one of the other creators on the platform and go, hey, I'm trying to do this sort of similar thing and you already do this really well, can you teach me how to do it? Um, and so we share skills that way. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about how the content food chain works. Um, so the creators make their content um, and they funnel it through Awesome Black and then it gets uh, pushed out to the various um, media platforms so some of the big ones are Twitch, Facebook Live, RSS, this is podcasts, um, and YouTube. And then there's a whole kind of sleuth of other sort of B, C, and D list um, platforms that you can uh, eat your content from. 
Um, and so the creatives kind of make it all and then put it in. They make 90% of it because this is sort of the way that content on the internet works for, um, on the internet um, for audiences is they consume it for free. And then you keep 10% back for members only content, um, which sits over here on the right. Um, and this is how, this is one of the ways that we monetize. So sort of like Netflix, you as a member buy a subscription to Awesome Black and you get to unlock that 10% of content that um, people are putting out there. Um, uh, and this is the financial model for Awesome Black. So you've got members subscriptions, um, sponsorships that are available, advertisers, um, so this was one of the big reasons for pooling audiences and pooling creatives together is if we can show that we have a large enough pooled audience, we can approach uh, private businesses and large corporations and go, Hey, look, we're, we're here, here's our audience numbers um, advertise with us and we'll, we'll talk about your product and talk about this online. And it's just giving us another way to sort of monetize this online um, creative content. Uh, and then we work with every one of the creatives to create a merch line um, if it fits right with them. Um, so this is one of the things that uh, members subscription gives you access to um, because you can do tiers of subscription, which I'll, I'll show you in a moment. Um, or you can purchase merchandise directly through um, the website which I'm going to jump through now. Um, so 80% of all of those um, uh, incoming money goes directly to the creatives and then 20% stays with Awesome Black to help commission new shows and support the upkeep of, um, of the organization. Uh, so I'm just going to do a new share um, and jump over to the website really quickly and I'll just show you a couple of little things. Um, so this is the awesome black website. Um, you have like the new content coming up here, um, various kind of creatives. You have our about section, um, who we are, the team, get in touch for sponsorship and advertising, um, podcasts, uh, with latest episode and then lists of all of our shows. Um, video content. Now we've only got one thing up there at the moment, which is a, for originals uh, mini series that we did um, gaming. So we're inviting gamers to come into the platform at the moment as some um, creators. Um, Cause we really both um, myself and my brother are um, big gamers and pop culture enthusiasts. And I believe like that gaming is a core part of, or is a, is going to be a core part of the arts moving forward. Um, and it's a great way to kind of tell stories differently. Um, and then I'll jump over to uh, the members section at the moment, but you've got our store here, apparel and merchandising. Um, so jump over to membership and become a member. And I'll just talk about the different tiers really quickly. Um, so you've got, and I'm, I'm cleaning this up. It's a bit of a work in process um, and making it prettier. Um, so you've got different tiers. So $2 a month gets you access to all of that um, just hidden content, the members only content. Um, level two, three, four, and five at different um, price points gets you uh, merchandise goodies along with access to that um, membership content. Um, so it's a good way to, as creatives, it's, uh, it gives you a direct portal for audiences to support your work um, and uh, kind of continued income over time. So like $2 a month is um, not, you know, not a huge outlay. Um, I kind of look at it as a micro transaction. And if we can get a thousand people at $2 to $2 a month, um, then it starts to add up and get distributed to the creatives. So when you pick your level, you get to choose which creatives you're supporting with your, with the 80%. Um, so that's kind of, me at this point, is there any questions at this stage? I, I, I have one. Um, at the very beginning, you talked about the content and actually putting up content that was made specifically for going online. 
in this period, has anyone come to you with content, maybe not specifically originally created to go online, maybe made for the physical experience that have been really keen to get it online? And how have you addressed that? What, what, what's, what have been the challenges? What's the opportunity in that? And, and how long did that take? Lots of questions all in one. Bit. Yeah, totally. Um, absolutely. I've had people contact me about um, putting their visual art piece into a gallery online or, and, and these are all things that can happen. Um, awesome Black is not necessarily the platform for that or the portal. Um, one of the things that we're also offering to members of the, um, of Awesome Black is to like help upskill or side skill people. Um, and uh, like we offer kind of a bit of training um, in, in that space to kind of get different, uh, different mediums into into the platform. Um, so I, I launched this a month ago. Um, I was originally going to launch it in June. Um, as I said, I've been working kind of for the last year to get this up and launched and have um, had a few failed funding applications for it. But um, with COVID-19, I decided to just like, I needed to forge ahead with it um, directly and get it up online as soon as possible. Um, not to try and take a piece of the pie um, because I think the pie is getting a lot slimmer, um, but more just, I know that I, we have um, for originals, my show um, and the other shows that I do, we have support people who want to support us, yeah. um, but they just needed the platform for it. Cool. And Vicky has sent us a question that she's curious about the idea of selecting which artists you want your subscription dollars to go to and what happens to those artists who may not get selected? Um, that's a, that's a good question. Um, so when you, when you uh, choose your membership, you get to kind of, you can choose like three to five and your subscription gets uh, distributed throughout. Um, and for those artists that don't, um, I guess it's a push for them. We try not to take people who don't have an audience already on board. Um, it's about kind of working with those people who have sort of a little bit of an established audiences so that we can build that then. Um, although if someone approaches us with um, a pitch, um, which we're open to, um, uh, we're gonna, going to work with them to get their work online and um, help them get an audience, which is where that 20% comes back in is that we want to have a commissioning fund um, within the next kind of 18 months to kind of move. Cool. Thanks, Travis. I think we'll continue the conversation as we, as we go through a, a thousand more questions around online audiences, the, 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 the content, the stories that are being told and how we connect that and the importance of sustaining that those stories and through this period. So I think that's a nice segue into Marinda. Marinda Donnelly, a Wiradjuri woman, lives in Mianjin, Queensland, and is currently executive producer at Black Dance. Black Dance is the national industry and producing organisation for First Nations dance in Australia. And Black Dance has held over 100 consultations with the sector since COVID-19. And I feel that number might be a little bit out of date because I'm, I'm sure that it continues to increase and is hosting regular online gatherings to cultivate connection during the pandemic. Black Dance is also part of the Tri-Nations Collective and is the co-founder of the 2018-2019 First Nations Dialogues New York, which has established a permanent First Nations platform at Performance Space New York. So Marinda will talk a little about the Black Dance experience since we came into the pandemic um, period era and how swiftly she led an online gathering and how, how that is supporting the First Nations community. Over to you, Marinda. Thank you. Um, Yama, everyone. Um, thanks for the opportunity to um, talk about Black Dance and um, our approach. Um, and also, um, thanks, Travis, um, for your presentation and and your approach um, to establishing such a critical Indigenous-led platform, um, certainly in our conversations um, over the last um, seven weeks, you know, this um, issue of an aspiration of um, digital sovereignty has been spoken about um, a lot. Um, so, you know, um, 
as as was introduced, Black Dance is a self-determined First Nations-led organisation. Um, and we're really proud to have a Black Dance Cultural Council um, that's made up of local elders and, um, you know, experienced senior dance practitioners. Um, and the Black Dance Cultural Council ensures cultural knowledge is a part of everyday business at Black Dance. Uh, we also work with independent dance artists, um, a number of um, unfunded uh, small to medium dance companies um, and their communities. And, and we work really hard at Black Dance to connect artists to industry, decision makers, program directors and potential collaborators. So our, our main um, purpose at Black Dance is to facilitate self-determination across the creation, distribution and presentation of First Nations dance. Uh, and the, just to give you a sense of the scale of the sector as we understand it, and it's um, certainly um, likely to be bigger than this, um, but roughly we, um, we understand the sector to be over 150 independent First Nations dance makers and choreographers. Um, and they're our primary um, cohort of stakeholders, but our services also aim to reach uh, the entire First Nations dance sector, which is a minimum of 200 community dance groups, eight unfunded small to medium Indigenous dance companies, four Indigenous youth dance companies. And in 2010, our founder, Marilyn Miller, estimated that there was at least 100,000 cultural dancers in Australia. Um, so we, you know, uh, aim to provide a service to everybody, but um, our um, primary um, stakeholder or remit is definitely sitting within those uh, group of 150 independents. Um, and so, as was mentioned, um, at the beginning of COVID-19, we spearheaded uh, a number of um, consultations and um, online gatherings. Um, and I probably should just acknowledge um, my colleague Zohar Spatz at La Boite, um, who uh, I understand was probably um, uh, quite um, first cab off the rank in a sense in terms of organising an industry roundtable to um, have a conversation about COVID-19 and what that means in our sector. and. I kind of um, witnessed that and reflected on um, Black Dancers' remit in not only being a producing organisation but having a role to play in advocacy um, and influencing. And, and, you know, we had a conversation with our team and reflected on the leadership we witnessed um, through Labot's quick action and we, we, we decided... Um, that we really needed um, to try and facilitate a First Nations-led approach to some of the um, issues relating to our sector for any kind of um, response and now what we're seeing is the recovery package um, for our arts and cultural sector. And um, so because Black Dance is um, primarily focused on dance, um, the first thing that we did was organise a meeting with um, the other uh, First Nations self-determined performing arts, multi-funded organisations um, nationally, which is Ilbidri, Morgulin and Yuriyakin. Um, and uh, we all, um, we meet every fortnight um, and we, we chat regularly to um, understand the, the needs that our communities are facing um, and to ensure that, um, you know, as a group of self-determined performing arts orgs, we're feeding up through the different advocacy channels um, the key issues um, that we're hearing from our communities. And so... Um, we pretty quickly ascertained that um, our first priority is ensuring our elders' safety to prevent loss of cultural knowledge um, and that our elders are the source of our culture and stories and basically without them we don't have a performing arts sector. Um, 
and then the second priority was that um, we, we really needed to work collectively and collegiately to ensure that, um, you know, during a time of isolation and social distancing, um, particularly for our communities in the First Nations sector that um, our culture and our kinship relies on um, contact and, and quite often a lot of physical contact. And so we, we really wanted to prioritise ways that we could ensure our spiritual well-being and mental health during isolation. Um, and of overwhelming concern for um, our small to medium Indigenous performing arts orgs was the fact that um, and it's been noted heaps um, on the First Nations Roundtable and, you know, lo various other um, platforms that the majority of um, Indigenous performing artists are independents. Um, and so it's really concerning um, when we think about our historical relationship with Centrelink um, and that um, the, the majority of the Indigenous performing arts sector as independents would then have to go and um, go through the process of applying for a job seeker, a job keeper, and uh, we're really aware that, um, that that that's a really complex relationship. And uh, we were hearing from our from a lot of our um, independents that um, they didn't want to apply to job keeper or job seeker. So that was really concerning. Um, I guess um, in terms of what we're learning and hearing at the moment um, from, you know, in, yes, it was 119 consultations as of last Friday. So um, it keeps that number keeps going up. Um, but I guess um, if I can distill what I think we're hearing the most um, in all of our online gatherings, locally, nationally, and globally, uh, all of our First Nations communities echo a pretty similar sentiment, which is pause. Slow down. Things have always been uncertain. Take your time. Don't rush. Be respectful of yourself and your situation and be responsible with your actions. Um, so I guess... Um, we're also hearing from artists that, um, and we hold a regular um, independent First Nations dance Zoom every fortnight, um, and we're hearing um, from artists that um, they're really appreciating the time and space to reflect, to contemplate and embrace the fullness of their cultural practice, um, which they often are, um, you know, running from job to job to job and so the the space in between to reflect is often um, something that um, is missing. Um, and so um, I guess in terms of the challenges or the shifting nature of the online consultations and um, what we're hearing, um, in summary, I would say that in the beginning, um, when we first started doing online gatherings, um, some of our, um, you know, participants hadn't gathered um, or connected and were um, quite feeling quite isolated and negative or low. Um, and then through the process of gathering and the changing nature of COVID-19, I think there was a, a midway point where um, people became uh, ad quite adapted to the current situation. And, and I guess now what we're hearing is um, much more emphasis on the recovery phase. Um, and so all of the 119 consultations that we've done currently are really informing um, Black Dancers' um, position on recovery. Um, we'd really like to build this, we'd really like to use this time to build and embed our sector. Um, and we've come up with this idea of uh, re-future, um, which invokes uh, changes to the current structures because we want First Nations-led online marketplaces and we want First Nations curators resource to program our work uh, after the pandemic one day when we come through all of this. 
Um, that's probably enough from me at the moment. Or questions? Uh, I'm back. I couldn't unmute myself. Thanks, Marinda. That was extraordinary. I felt like I just went on, an, on a, on a, a six-week journey with you explaining how from that moment of that first gathering and that first conversation and the identification of those two priorities to the journey over the last um, six weeks or so. Um, ex extraordinary. Can you tell us just a little bit more about um, the, the concept of pause, which I, I found just so welcoming then, because I think there's a lot of people rushing and I think there's, there's quite a sense of speed and some days are very, very, very fast and something might happen in the morning and it's very different by the end of the day. But I think the concept of, of pausing and taking a breath and taking a moment to, to look and, and absorb and, and look ahead. Is that, can, can you tell us just a little bit more about that before we move on, if you can? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, I've got to just do a little shout out to Ben Gratz um, because, um, and actually to Jacob Bohm as well. When I, um, I, I personally um, often tend to go quite, um, you know, full steam ahead. And so um, I actually have really um, appreciated my peers um, checking in on me and um, really reinforcing this idea of pause. Um, but, you know, it's not, it's not something um, that, you know, um, just happens here or there. It is every single online Zoom or gathering that we have. The, and and our, um, the process that we've adopted at Black Dance is that um, wherever possible, we will get an elder to um, open and close our online gathering. Um, and we've been able to do this because um, Arts Queensland has put our rent on hold for a little while. And so we quickly repurposed some of the um, money that we were paying um, rent with to um, pay our elders to open and close our, you know, whatever online gathering um, we were doing. And so it's been really, really great actually because um, it's often our elders reinforcing these messages. Um, and it's been really great to be able to offer them, um, you know, it's only a um, symbolic, you know, fee, but to be able to offer them a, a very small fee and say we value them as, um, you know, living cultural treasure and heritage, um, you know, and, and for some it might be simple as simple as that's groceries for the week, you know. So um, in our small way, in the kind of um, uh, small resourcing that we have, we've tried really hard to ensure that we do bring elders into every meeting. And, um, yeah, it's definitely um, reinforced this idea of pausing and slowing down by elders, but it's also... Um, like almost every every someone in the in the meeting as well says the same thing. I'm going to take it with me to my next one and, and for the for the following time. There's a lovely comment in the in the chat box, um, so I'm just going to read it out in full. Um, black dance not only acts as advocacy for many of us independent dancers. Black dance is strengthening the industry for First Nations independent performers. It's great to be supported nationally and in turn supporting community growth from the work we do on a national and international level. So congratulations on the extraordinary work so far. Um, I think we, we do need to continue the pause and I think we do need to step our way carefully, carefully ahead. So thanks, Marinda. I'll jump over to John now. Um, John is a Mungarai man. John's an artist in the Black Coordinator at the Arts Law Centre of Australia. He has extensive experience in the in Indigenous visual arts industry and has worked at a diverse range of institutions, including most recently at the University of New South Wales in the Faculty of Art and Design. 
John will introduce arts law and share some of the solutions that arts law have put in place to make their resources accessible to the community, as well as case studies and questions that have arisen within this new environment. So I'll just switch over to... And I'll just zip up to the top. Over to you, John. Right. Um, hello, everybody, and thank you, and thank you to fellow panellists. Um, my name is John Way. Um, first off, now I do have notes in front of me because I lose track. So um, I am the Art Law Centre of Australia, acknowledged the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional owners of the country of where we're based in Sydney. Um, we also recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's continuing connection to land, place, waters and community. I and we pay our respects to them, their heritage, their cultures, and to the elders past, present and emerging. So on the first slide, you can just basically see where we go. We're national and what we do. So Artists in the Black is a specialised service for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander artists or creators. It sits within the Arts Law Centre of Australia, um, which is a national legal, legal centre, community legal centre for artists. Um, AITB, Artists in the Black, uh, aims to provide access to free or low cost, culturally appropriate, specialised legal resources and support with the aim to um, support Indigenous arts and the culture sector overall. Now, the other thing with that is we do have quite a lot of re good relationships with other legal firms around the country. So we have a strong pro bono support as well. Okay, so why do we do this? And why do I do this? We want to contribute through the law, Indigenous people and artists to achieve their professional excellence and get sustainable income, that means getting paid properly, in a non-exploitive way or stopping artists to get ripped off. As we all know, there's things going on out there. Um, the other thing, which is sort of a longer term, is getting Indigenous cultural and intellectual property, um, ICIP as it's known, um, integrated into not just best practice, but in the legal sense. And I'm sure Tricia and when you speak to um, Terry Janke later on, they'll be able to kind of delve deeper into that and how that's achieved, not in both ways. Um, Artists in the Black is actually not related to Bar Bar Black Sheep. It is related to a financial situation of artists to be in the black, meaning financially sustainable, um, which I sometimes giggle at. Okay, so I guess the two main things is equipping Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander artists, artists creatives, organisations and communities with methods to develop sustainable arts and cultural practices um, on some of the projects we work with. And I guess the ethos in that is when we work with a specific community, we want to be able to make sure that it's geographically and culturally specific, basically doing it the right way with um, Indigenous people there and that. So, you know, what happens in Broome might be different to what's needed in Harvey Bay. What the needs are in Sydney is different to what the needs are in Cairns. But it's still underneath that umbrella of acknowledging the difference and the same and making the law accessible through the arts and helping people and that. So we do provide things in a lot of languages and to age groups and basically being culturally appropriate. Um, one of the other broader things with that, which some people may be aware of, is the Fake, Harm, Fake Art Harms Culture Campaign, which was launched in 2016, which alongside with uh, other agencies such as the Indigenous Art Code and the Copyright Agency and the support of many others, the ca this campaign particularly aims to educate and advocate for law reform to recognise the cultural rights of traditional knowledge holders and communities and stop the exploitation or the rip-offs coming into the country of fake Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultural material, which is often made overseas. Um, Indigenous people aren't 
being paid a cent, missing out on earning a wage and the overall ripoff. The other thing too, which um, Trish and I think Terry will talk about in a broader contact is arts law has also been supporting the international recognition of Indigenous rights, particularly around ICIP and traditional knowledge with WIPO, uh, the World Intellectual Property Organisation and that. So um, if we go to slide two, if you get on our website and that, and get to a part of the info hub, we have lots of information for creatives, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, but specifically for Indigenous, there's an artist in the black as well. In there, there is a lot of information on individual information sheets about how to put your content online. These resources for creatives include information and templates that you can use in your own practice. Um, two really quick examples are the media arts information sheet and a template copyright license that you can use. And then you can also come back to us for advice. Um, contacts create us. We get a lot of contact every day asking questions about a multiple kind of basket of things. Often on that slide, are kind of like the top ones. Um, this particularly becomes more of an issue when people are collaborating with others. Um, when someone else is asking about how to use someone at someone's work and the way that they use their work, sometimes um, people feel pressured to hand things over. People um, don't want to say no or feel that they can't. And I think that kind of relates to the previous speakers that in this current era, you know, it gives Indigenous people time to pause, time to make space and time to negotiate what they want to do. And that's for communities and for individuals alike. Uh, I thought that was a really nice thing what people were saying before. Um, one of the other information sheets which seems to be very popular at the moment is putting your film or photo online. Um, people seem to be downloading that at quite a uh, fast rate. So that particular one has information about what to consider, all the illegal issues. It's for artists and arts organisations um, as everyone is scrambling to maintain a source of income and trying to still keep their products out there. They're putting things online. So we want people to kind of be aware of what's going on around there. And that also includes um, hosting sites, including YouTube, Facebook, Vimo, Flickr, and all those other things. So, you know, I encourage people to get out there and have a look at that, just so you've cover your back, basically. Now, you know, other considerations is the use of names and images associated within the project. And we also want you to confirm with your contracts, if you do, when you do enter contracts, you know, confirm the rights that have been licensed. And, you know, if you're referencing or using Indigenous cultural and intellectual property in the work, make sure you do the right thing and that. So you can find that information there as well. Okay, so what does that really mean? In, if we move to slide three, is I guess broadly AITB and arts law is trying to promote best practice. Best practice for Indigenous creatives and non-Indigenous creatives to work together when they're creating their works or individually. You know, you, we want the cultural industry and our mobs to be able to maximise your advantage, right? As an individual, your community, by understanding the legal principles and getting things like a contract to protect you and your community properly. Um, you know, we've also worked with 
of course, non-Indigenous business and stuff to help create the right way to do things when engaging with Indigenous individuals and organisations. Now, I guess kind of in coming towards the end of this is, you know, we know that Indigenous peoples, artists and practices draw works and draws and utilises quite a lot of other things. So I guess another consideration when Indigenous people are even asked to be, I guess they say consultants in some cases, where a collaboration has taken place, the onus is on the Indigenous person to sort of provide all the things onto a story or into a play or into stuff. So, you know, make sure that you have, you, you're comfortable and you've secured all the right things internally before you start engaging with the broader world and with the digital stuff. Feel comfortable that you have that right. And I guess um, one thing that this kind of current situation, as Marinda pointed out, was pausing. Um, another interesting concept I've heard lately, ironically, that this has provided a space for Indigenous people and Indigenous communities to sort of consolidate where looking forward, where we want to be. What, what do we want to share? What we don't want to share? What does this look like? You know, what's our strengths? What do we need to work on? So I, thought, I think that's a very interesting thing that I've noticed coming through. Um, and when we've made resources with people in the past and what look moving forward into the future post this coronavirus stuff is a lot of communities and indi in individuals are becoming very clear about we want this, but we don't want that. We want this in our language or we want it this way. And I just thought, ironically, it's probably a nice, it's a good space at the moment for creatives to renegotiate their own destiny, where they want to go. So I just think I was interested with how other people have been talking about that. Um, so I guess we should go to the next slide. Thanks, John. So here's a list of the digital resources that we do have up at the moment, um, kind of relating, I guess, to this current place we're in. Um, and I guess the final point is within this new environment, people, and in the past, people use first and ask later. This can create all sorts of issues, including the copyright and cultural permission space and that. So taking into account that Indigenous Australians understand that new technologies and the digital space provides many ways for us to connect, express, promote, discuss good and bad issues, news and our culture. I think, you know, let's, especially we're working with non-Indigenous people as well, let's double down and going, what do we want? What do we don't want? Let's move this forward. So for Indigenous practitioners too, you know, we often, Indigenous people in the cultural in, uh, industry operate on many layers and consider many layers, probably more layers than other areas and especially when we're collaborating. So again, let's examine those layers, look at that, how, how does this work? What's been working? What is best practice? Who, what do we need to do? I guess that's kind of like protection and that. So I guess look at arts laws, maybe your legal health check for all of us to move forward. Um, and you can ring us, get on with our website, email, um, and talk to us. I guess that's kind of it, really. Um, thanks. Thanks, John. That was incredibly rich with so much information there, and, and you shared so much. Um, I have lots of questions, but oh. 
the spirit of time, I think we might just jump to Trish and then come back to some other questions if that's okay, just so we can um, just make sure that everybody's not held up at the end. Over to you. Oh, actually, Trish, I just wanted to read a little bit about Trish. Trish is a Wathafi Marbial Islander and Ghanaian woman from Sydney. Trish has a Bachelor of Arts and Law from UNSW. She currently works at the Australia Council for the Arts as the First Nations Arts and Cultural Director. Trish will introduce First Nations protocols that were developed by the Australia Council with Terry Janke. Over to you, Trish. Just having a little trouble hearing Trish at the moment. Can you go again? Okay. Renee, I might just stop my video and just see if that lets Trish's voice through. Can you keep talking, Trish? No, can't hear you. Oh, Trish, you need to turn up your volume. Can you turn up your volume, Trish? Yep. Nope, still not working, still not working. Oh, it was working before, what's changed? Okay, maybe put your headphone back in. Sorry. Don't you just love technology? This is our little pause moment where we're pausing, digesting. Is that better? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Brilliant. See? Great. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so we had a pause. <laughs> um, yeah, so thank you, Celia, and to the other panellists as well. Um, I'd like to start off by acknowledging um, Camaragal country and the people here in Sydney and paying my respects to our elders past and present um, today. Uh, so, as Celia said, I'll really be looking at um, sort of a brief history um, and the development of our First Nations protocols that we've developed here at Australia Council uh, with Dr. Terry Jenke. Um, I won't go into a sort of detail around um, digital protocols because Terry will be actually talking about these issues tomorrow at our Creative Connections webinar um, from three o'clock New South Wales time. Um, so just really in relation to the protocols, and I'll just share my screen. I'll try and do that because I've got a bit of a um, PowerPoint. But these protocols were developed um, back in 2002 in relation to uh, the gaps that exist under uh, existing intellectual property laws in Australia. And Article 31 of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples um, underpin the foundations um, of the rights of Indigenous cultural IP uh, worldwide. And um, back in 2009, the Australian government endorsed the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, but we're still yet to see um, uh, a law to fully protect Indigenous culture uh, in Australia. And so that's why um, we worked with Terry Jenke to develop these protocols, which are really uh, best practice guidelines um, for users and organisations and artists who want to work with Indigenous cultural uh, material. Because of that uh, gap between existing IP laws, as John mentioned, like copyright, like your trademark, like your design laws. Um, so we introduced these protocols across all the different um, art forms at Council. So we've got on our website these protocols um, for visual arts, literature, dance, um, music, and uh, media arts as well. And the protocols look at nine principles um, whereby uh, a, a user or an outsider who's working with that Indigenous cultural material 
um, can engage in these principles so that there is proper protocol, there is proper customary practice um, um, used when, when working with those communities. So these principles um, really rest on looking at respect, um, Indigenous control, communication, consultation, proper consent from the beginning of a project to the end of the project, um, respecting any type of secrecy or confidentiality, you know, secret or sacred Indigenous cultural material, um, as well as making sure that copyright and any royalties are shared um, with that Indigenous person or community. Um, so that, you know, we do have these protocols in place um, to really respect uh, the, the customary practice and obligations that that Indigenous person or that community has um, with their Indigenous cultural material. So as I said, these protocols, there's five of them with the different art forms, they are available on the Australia Council website. Um, they were first developed in 2002 and then revised uh, back in 2007. And we have also been working with Terry Jenke over the last year to uh, revise these protocols um, so that we can update the legal information in these protocols as well as come up with 10 new case studies um, across um, the art forms that look at the, the different, the nine principles of the protocols. So those should be available um, later this year. We're just working through um, the draft as I speak. And then um, I thought I'd just sort of briefly um, talk about the work that's been happening um, at Australia Council uh, under Lydia Miller and her team uh, with the National Indigenous Arts and Cultural Authority. Um, so this is quite a big um, concept. Again, the National Indigenous Arts and Cultural Authority um, is really a, a, an aspiration or an idea that a lot of people in the First Nations arts sector have been talking about um, for the last um, sort of two to three decades around having a national peak body that can advocate on behalf of um, Indigenous artists, arts organisations, the various Indigenous peak bodies that we have, and also the cultural custodians and elders who hold and, and cherish that knowledge um, for our communities. Uh, so the Australia Council um, with the ATSIA team and Lydia Miller and myself um, have been uh, doing consultations across the country over the last two years around what the First Nations art sector want to see um, in the peak body, what sort of, what would the membership of the peak body look like, um, the scope of activities that this body might do, um, how would this body be funded? Would it be, um, it's obviously would be a self-determined organisation, but would it be government funded? Um, would it uh, raise money through membership fees? So all those types of issues around how you'd set up um, a peak body uh, nationally. And so um, I think because we've also done a survey um, uh, in the consultations and, and talked to the sector about um, you know, what are the sort of main issues that NIACA could stand for and the issues around protocols uh, and uh, protection of ICIP is a really, really big issue. And so it's really important that um, we keep talking about these issues. We keep advocating um, for new laws to better protect uh, Indigenous cultural IP rights, but also practice and use the protocols in an appropriate way um, as an arts sector. Uh, when applicants come to the Australia Council for funding, um, you'll also find once you apply that if you are working with an Indigenous organisation or artist or using Indigenous cultural materials, that um, it's important that you engage with these protocols uh, as well. And then just finally, I just had a few uh, fast and fun tips around, um, you know, use of artwork in this kind of online space that we're seeing during COVID. Um, so, you know, it is really important if you are having Zoom meetings and online meetings to still acknowledge country, you know, wherever you may be across this beautiful country. In terms of um, posting artworks, 
um, on online on a website. Uh, you know, as an artist, you might consider um, putting a watermark or using low res resolution images um, so that sort of deters people from um, copying your, your image. Also, if you're going to be using artworks like the one here in a Zoom meeting, um, it's always important to get permission from the artist. So this artwork is by uh, New South Wales and uh, Murray artist Bibi Barber and she gave me permission to use the artwork in, in this meeting. Um, also, if you're looking at uh, posting performances or, or, or um, artworks on any social media sites, uh, really look at the terms and conditions of that social media site because you might be entering into a non-exclusive um, license for that social media site to, to be able to use your work. So have a look at that. And then also in terms of uh, any performance or artwork, it's really important always to ask permission first before you use that um, work uh, on a site or on uh, the online space. And as I said, um, uh, talk to um, Terry Jenke for any further information around the digital protocol space. As I said, she'll be talking tomorrow um, at the uh, Creative Connections webinar from three o'clock New South Wales time. Um, so she'll be talking more about that and um, get in touch with John or um, Suzanne or Robin at the Arts Law Centre for any more information um, that you saw John talk about in relation to um, sample agreements or any type of legal advice that you might um, need. And there's also the Copyright Council, which has really good information sheets as well <clears throat> on copyright issues. Um, so I think, yeah, thank you for your time. Thanks. Thanks, Trish. Um, I know we're right on three o'clock and I did promise the panellists that I would wrap this up as close to three as I could. Does anyone have any other burning questions for our panellists? Um, we will be putting this, this piece, this um, video back online so people will be able to access it as well as all of the resources from the, um, from the presentation so that everyone can actually continue to share, to share that um, going forward. And if you have any other questions for the panellists and you can't reach them, just send them through to us at digitalsolutions at australiacouncil.gov.au. I just wanted to say a big, big, big thank you to Travis, John, Trish and Marinda again for sharing with such generosity and, and spirit, such important information. Um, I, I don't want to steal, steal it with too many, too many other questions, but um, thank you again. Um, don't forget to look out for all of the other offerings on the Australia Council website this week, the Creative Connections and the First Nations Roundtable on Friday afternoon each week at two o'clock. Um, and if you have any other ideas and any other content and conversations that you would like to ask this particular group um, in the Facebook Digital Solutions group, send us an email or post into that group and we'll be looking to curate the next sessions with your input because that's how we're trying to roll with this is that each week we're responding with the questions, the topical questions, and they're changing on a week by week basis. Um, so I'll just wrap it up because we are over time. So thank you everybody once again and cheerio.